Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. You've logged on to the Nelson Labs webinar, Laboratory Testing of Medical Face Masks and Respirators for Assuring Disinfection and Continued Performance After Treatment for Reuse. Just a few housekeeping items. If you miss one of our webinars or would simply like to refer to, back to one, you can always find them on the Nelson Labs website on the on-demand webinars page listed under education. You can receive notifications and upcoming, for upcoming live and on-demand webinars by liking Nelson Labs on Facebook or following on Twitter and LinkedIn. Nelson Labs is a leading global provider of laboratory testing and expert advisory services for medtech and pharmaceutical companies. The company performs over 800 rigorous microbiological and analytical laboratory tests across the medical device, pharmaceutical, and protective barrier industries. The experts at Nelson know every test matters and requires solutions to complex problems to improve patient outcomes and minimize client risk. So let's get started. Today we are joined by two members of the Nelson Labs team, Alpha Patel, Principal Scientist, and Janelle Benz, uh, Department Scientist. Alpha is a certified microbiologist and has been part of the medical device industry for 18 years, specializing in cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of reusable medical devices, endoscopes, and validation of tissue, disinfection, or sterilization processes. Her current role as principal scientist at Nelson involves overseeing test method validations for reprocessing, writing standard protocols, and standard operating procedures for reprocessing and other internal and globally related documents, providing technical consulting for reprocessing sections at Nelson Laboratories in Salt Lake City and globally. Alpha presents at Nelson Laboratory seminars, trade shows, FDA, Amy, and client facilities across the U.S. and international sites. Janelle has been employed at Nelson Labs for nearly seven years and is the department scientist in the protective de barriers department of the company. As an expert in many of the surgical gown and drape and medical face mask and respirator standards, she helps oversee the testing in this section. As a member of the ASTM F23 committee and convener of ISO TC94 SC13 and working group six, she helps lead standard development for testing medical protective clothing. Her presentation will outline the test methods required for medical face masks, NIOSH approved N95 respirators and barrier face coverings in an effort to highlight the differences between the products and their uses. She received her BS in biochemistry from Brigham Young University and an MS from University of Queensland. Now beginning today's presentation will be Alpha Patel. Thank you, Mike, for the brief introduction. Um, just moving on with the presentation. Today's agenda, Mike has given you a debrief. However, um, I have put an agenda together that will give you more of what we will be discussing. It will be a two-part um, presentation where I will be talking about uh, validation strategy for novel methods, uh, some of the regulatory risks that, that are out there for bio burn or log reduction or decontamination methods, um, how to do these validation plans, face mask and decontamination that involve microbial efficacy, face mask test performance, and biocompatibility assessments. Janelle will go over respirator, medical face mask, and barrier covering standards and testing requirements. These are the integrity tests that are performed after the decontamination tests that, are, uh, that, that have, have happened on the masks and then they're followed by these type of integrity tests and some, and some that are used for single use as well. Now, the first question we always ask when we were um, faced by COVID in last year, March, 2020, was uh, how do we start? Where, how, how, how do we decontaminate the single use face masks and respirators? And how do we move, move on? One thing that, um, was not clear even with the regulatory was the definitions of of these decontamination methods what's cleaning is not disinfection and what's disinfection is not sterilization so the terminology had to had to play an effect of 
how are we doing these? These face masks cannot be cleaned. They can only be decontaminated so how, or sterilized. And how are we going to move forward with that? We need to determine the contributing factors when, when we thought about this. Uh, will that affect the PPE and the person in concern? How can we perform these validation steps or write a validation design to, to consider all of these things? Uh, we had to determine if variables are feasible at the site. Do they have these programs? If we're using, uh, for example, a VHP, which is vaporized hydrogen peroxide to decontaminate these face masks, does the healthcare facility have means to, to um, subcontract it? And is it close by or do they have a, do they have the modality to do it in-house? That is also another consideration that needs to play a role. And you need to understand the measurable attributes. What I mean by that is after you decontaminate, it doesn't stop there. How do you move forward? What is the next step that you have to do? When, when you are determining what is the next process, how do, what are we calling this? Are we disinfecting? Are we disinfecting it? Are we sterilizing it? And how do we go about doing that? Um, one of the things that helped uh, Nelson Labs was we created a task group and the task group put together this beautiful flow chart that I have here. And it went through every step and would categorize if it's sterile, if it's disinfection or if it's sterilization and what route you have to go through. And once you've gone through these routes, what is the next steps that you have to consider in validation? So all the risks have to be played in role. What happened earlier was there was a shortage of PPE and we had to think immediate. We had to think now. And a lot of things were bypassed. And one of the things that were bypassed was by compatibility and um, how that affects uh, the user. And once you're using these different method, different modalities of disinfection and sterilization, how is it affecting that? And that was one of the things that uh, Nelson did consider in the beginning as we do work with reusable medical devices and biocompatibility has always been part of that risk assessment. We did have some guidance documents and there are many guidance documents now that do help with considering what methods you can use for decontamination face masks, um, what bioburn reduction systems are there for surgical masks, respirators, the advice and recommendations from NIOSH, from FDA, from CDC are all in place now to move forward with these type of decontamination. One thing to remember is these guidance documents are always in a revising mode. So you're always gonna see changes. What we saw in March, 2020 to March I mean, to April 2020, to what we have now in March 2021, things have changed and, and things have moved along in terms of decontamination of face masks. The decontamination methods, modalities, how to perform it, what bioburn log reduction values are needed have fluctuated a little bit. Um, so to keep So to keep in contact with all these parties is very important. There's a lot of universities that are still currently doing a lot of tests on these decontamination face masks. Um, manufacturers always reach out to the manufacturers and see what they have done as R&D or provided or are researching. CDC is always available and they have their current updated information on their website. Same with NIOSH and same with FDA. Study validation plans are left to interpretation all the time because there is no strict guidance or, or a protocol design that's outlined by regulatory authorities to say, this is how you have to follow it. So it's always um, in a revolving motion and it's always moving for these type of studies. The one approach that is the best approach to move forward is if you're doing an EUA, FDA will help expedite the evaluation process as long as you have these bulleted points in there. You, you want to make sure you have a description of the process for the disinfection or decontamination you're doing. You have controls in place that show that your process is valid. 
you want to definitely have a bioborne log reduction outlined. What is this? What are you testing? What organisms are you challenging with? Description of chain of custody. If you are doing a third party, how are you um, going to make sure that these face masks get to the same person? Or how are you labeling these? Material compatibility. The method you're using for decontamination. Is it appropriate for the material that this face mask is made of? Filtration performance with repeated use. Um, fit test data and a copy of the decontaminated device prior to labeling instructions. All of these things, as long as you have all of these things addressed in some manner, doesn't have to be perfect, but some manner, it can help you expedite your EUA. Some things to know is there are some respirators that have been identified by regulatory agency that are no longer authorized to be decontaminated fully use. There are approximately 80 masks that can't be decontaminated. And if you go to the FDA website, there is a lot written on there. And um, you want to make sure that the face mask you're use it, using for decontamination is on the list to be decontaminated. It would be, it would be a shame if you use a mask and do all the testing up front and later to find out that uh, these are not authorized to be decontaminated or reused. Um, you all, one thing that is very um, clearly stated, if you go into the website, is EUAs uh, will no longer support or authorize decontamination of respirator, respirators that have exhalation valves. So any respirators that have exhalation valves, that you cannot do a decontamination or qualify as a reuse product. This year, in Jan 26, 2021, uh, we had finally um, a webinar by the FDA, which they do, uh, I think it's every two weeks, to update the public on new methods that have developed or new standards that they have written and what is moving forward to, to be notified of what is happening with these face masks, which is great for the public and it's great for um, third parties to understand that there is this that the FDA has provided and, and is collaborating with the industry to come up with better methods. One thing they discussed on this webinar was dry heat. Um, what we have learned also that dry heat is one method that is very capable and is very promising when you want to do reuse and decontamination of face masks. There is a lot of information on dry heat, and so we recommend that you do go to the FDA website or even CDC website and read up on it. Um, what some of the things that was highlighted in this webinar was the when you're using dry heat, it is only to be reused by a single user. This is not going to be done by multiple users, and it's just for the single user. You have to show a three log reduction of two gram positive and two gram negative bacteria. So they have they have identified what log reduction is needed when you're doing a dry heat decontamination and what type of organisms would qualify for this. You also have to do a reusability study. Of course, this is reusable. So you have to make sure how far can you go before you have to discard that mask and reuse it again once you have performed this cycling of dry heat and uh, five days is what was specified by in this webinar anyway is that five days was something that they saw was appropriate if using dry heat some of the things that they also discussed is the same thing i discussed before you, sh you can't have exhalation valves not qualified for for um reuse um, you can't incorporate ductbill design. That doesn't work either. And you can't have antimicrobial or antiviral agents. So those are some of the things that is do not list. And it's clearly labeled here. And also what we talked about before, there are some face um, respirators that are not reusable. And you have to make sure that you are using stuff that is reusable and can be reused. Now, when you go into 
the validation plan. So now you've figured out all of these things that we have with the regulatory, what we have to use. You have identified your mask. Now, this is the respirator that I'm going to use to, de to do a decontamination. How do I start? There is a threefold approach with that. You want to ensure the efficacy of the decontamination methods. So you want to make sure you're using the right method. You want to ensure the, the respirator will be functional after all these decontamination procedures have happened. And at the end, the user is safe. They are not breathing in any chemicals or it's not going to cause any rash. You, all, you always want to make sure the user is safe. That is the end game for it. How to start setting up testing parameters. Now, how do you start that? You want to make sure that you choose the right microorganisms, which they the regulatory agency have specified in, in their documents what is appropriate. Um, methods of sterilization or decontamination, what needs to be established? What do we need to think about? What are the variables that are going to play a role in? That is one of the things that when you do an EUA, the regulatory agency wants to know all the variables have been checked off, which includes time, temperature, durability. Are you testing the straps? Are you testing the nose clips? What are happening with the staples that, that have been placed on these respirators or surgical masks if you're doing those? Um, practicality, is this even usable? Concentration, loading configuration, big thing. When your loading configuration is big, it, it, is, it is something that is not discussed readily, but it is a very important factor when you're when you're thinking of sterilization. How to allow for accessibility to all services of the masks. This is something we face with UV. You want to make sure that all the surfaces have been taken care of when you're decontaminating. And respirator test performance and residuals like we talked about earlier. When we, when, when you are determining what organism to, to use, one thing you want to understand is that coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus, is a lipid virus, which sits on the bottom of the pyramid scale of resistance scale of dermocidal processes. And when you, if you have looked at the BioBurn standard that the FDA has published, it does go over this pyramid scale. And it does talk about that because this virus sits on the bottom of the scale, we can test two higher and they have gone to bacterial spores and mycobacterium which was last year was the main focus of the testing um, now when you are reaching for the, the highest level of pyramid you're going to lose something at the end and that may be the integrity test so you want to make sure that um, when you're trying to show a six log reduction for these organisms, you're, you're not destroying the face mask in the process. Um, soon that was determined that, you know what, that it is difficult to get that log reduction with a decontamination method for respirators and face masks. So we're seeing a lot more um, EUAs for tier three, where for dry heat, I just explained, there's a three log reduction for uh, two gram positives and two gram negatives. So this table is something that is a good table to have when you're determining what organism you want to test and what tier you want to do for your bioburn decontamination. This tiered chart was prepared by the regulatory agency with risk in mind, and uh, they have given this to us to determine what we should do. But we are just to bring to your attention, we're seeing more studies with the tier three approach because by the, if we are moving on to the tier one, um, by the time we get a six log re reduction on a spore or a mycobacterium, the, um, we are in the process of, of destroying the face mask as well. And it may be fine for the first use or the second use, but not more, not more than that. Now, once you have figured out the organisms and what tier you want to do, now we're looking at what are we inoculating these with? We have to challenge them. How are we going to challenge them? A lot of these face masks are porous. So when you put bacteria, they're going to be, they're going to be sucked right in. 
And are we just doing the top layers? Are we doing the bottom layers? Are we doing the straps? Are we doing in between? Are we injecting it into the layers? These are the questions that the regulatory agency usually does ask. And uh, are we taking care of uh, the test soils, the sebum, the oils that are perspiring when you put them on? Um, have we considered that? These are some of the things that I have bulleted out here that are questions that you will get when you are designing a validation plan. Contamination method is a huge one because that is what determines your outcome for the log reduction. Once you've contaminated your masks, now you're moving on to the decontamination methods. Now, there are some sterilization methods that I have placed and some decontamination methods that have been used. Are all available to use? They are available to try. Um, I don't know if they're all available to use and have shown functional data to promote the method. Um, we know that ozone, anything with ozone deteriorates the, the, um, the mask and the strings that go over the straps. Uh, U, UV is not accessible in all the areas. It may get the front of the face mask and the bottom, but not in the middle layers. It's having a hard time to penetrate. Liquid, when you use IPA, what's happening is that when you spray anything on, the electrostatic charges change the charge and, the, and so it's no longer functional as it was supposed to be. Same with bleach. And so you wanna make sure that the method that you're using for decontamination is is appropriate and you've done all your homework to ensure that you are not taking things out of the face masks that are already on there. With ethylene oxide, chlorine dioxide, you wanna make sure that residuals have been addressed and uh, radiation, the, the metal on the straps will cause problems with it, right? So there they are all these different variables that do play a role when you're determining a decontamination method. So it's, it's good to do homework or, or R&D before you move forward to make sure that it's not deteriorating the mask. It may kill the bacteria that you need, but it may deteriorate the mask in the process. Performance testing. Now with performance testing, you've done your decontamination. One thing you wanna remember is one test does not fit all. Surgical masks, respirators, and barrier face coverings, which are, which are cloth masks, all have different criteria, and they're not the same criteria. So please be aware of that. Some of the similarities among surgical masks and uh, surgical N95 are these four tests are usually what we see that are recommended by the agency, um, fluid resistance, filtration efficiency, breathability, particulate and bacterial, when you're doing that, flammability and biocompatibility. These four are usually on the panel that are referred to and requested when you are doing decontamination. So you wanna make sure that at least you have covered your basis on these four test methods. As for, as for the barrier face covering, the, the, a new standard has come out just in March, just this, this month, um, ASTM 3502, that does require different recommendations and different tests that are required that Janelle will go over when, when she goes over the integrity tests. Now for EUA for surgical face masks, it's basically the same platform that is for the respirators and it was issued in August 5th, 2020, but it's the same thing. You wanna make sure that the surgical masks are FDA cleared, surgical masks that are meant, these are excluded from the scope. Sorry, I should have said that. They are excluded from the scope and are not authorized for EUA. The surgical masks that are FDA cleared, that are manufactured in China and then have antimicrobial antiviral. Same, same thing that the respirators have as well. These are some of the tests that uh, when we were listening to the webinar, uh, the regulatory agency did specify for EUA for surgical face masks. Um, you want the fluid resistant requirement tests. You want flammability 
particulate filtration, airflow resistance, and you want to make sure you test the materials for biocompatibility to make sure it is non irritant or non sensitizing. So they have given enough guidance and what methods should be used for these validations. So it's very clear and it has very good information. So if you are wanting to reuse surgical face masks, these are the tests that you want to follow. And um, CDC has more information on that on their website as well. Now, when we're talking about everything in, in Encompass, we, we also have to include by compatibility. Why? Because it's the user aspect of it. You want to make sure that the, the user is wearing this face mask with safety and there is nothing going on in that term. So it's very important that you do that. Healthcare workers have shared their pics and their bruises, blisters, and all of that on the website that I'm sure you all have seen. So you want to make, that is one thing that the regulatory agency is very strong about, um, is by compatibility. Now, they, you could also do a risk-based approach where if you don't, if there are common chemicals that are used, we, they, there is a method that uh, you can look up and figure out how this is a risk to the user and they are accepting risk-based approach consisting. Consider a review of cytotoxicity tests, review of mask materials. So you, you probably will have to do some R&D, um, which will contact phase. And so you don't have to do these big long tests because you, irritation and sensitization do take months to complete. There is another option where a risk-based approach could be performed. In summary, I would like to say that um, a validation takes all of these groups together. You have to collaborate with all parties. And when I mean all parties, I'm talking about all the regulatory agencies, face mask manufacturers, um, third party laboratories, everybody. And you have to consider possible risks to the method that you're choosing. So you always want to do some small uh, R&D tests to ensure before you move directly into a validation plan. Um, execution strategy plan is very important. Like I showed you in my slides up in the front, that it is very important to take risks and how you're going to follow your validation plan as soon as you move on. I'm going to um, I'm going to move the car, move the presentation to Janelle now, as she will go over face covering standards and testing terminology. Thanks, Alpha. Um, just to start off with some terminology that's a little bit unusual for the testing world, um, we use consensus standards and testing standards to dictate some of that testing that Alpha had mentioned. Um, a consensus standard generally has several test methods either referred to or in it and, and talks about the required performance for a mask. And then those testing standards dictate how the testing should be performed. Formed. Titer is just a fancy word that scientists use to talk about the concentration of a bacteria. Um, and then the three different types of, of products that you might put on your face. Um, a respirator is designated in the U.S. with those N ratings, 95, N99, N100. Um, in Europe, you'll see FFP1, FFP2, FFP3. Um, you may have seen the Asian designations of KN95, KN99. Um, there, there are several requirement sets for a respirator, um, but those are the products that fit tightly to your face and are measured pretty strictly, as we'll talk about when we talk about the test methods. A medical face mask is similar to the pleated type masks that we've seen a lot of people wear during the pandemic. And they're split up as well into to level one, two, and three by the US standard, and type one, type two, and type two R by the European standard. A barrier face covering, as Alpa mentioned, is a, a new standard that was just published this month, and they've got two levels as well. Um, Alpa mentioned some of the filtration efficiency tests. So what you'll see is our shorthand BFE for bacterial filtration, VFE for viral filtration and PFE for particulate filtration. 
And then face velocity is just a measure of, of how quickly those particles are, are hitting the front of the mask. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we talk about the test. So let's start off with respirator standards and testing. We'll focus on the US. Um, NIOSH oversees that testing and, and has a code of federal regulations, 42 CFR part 84, as well as some specific test method standards that are followed for that testing. Um, EN149 is, is a European analog and there's, as I mentioned others, GB2626 is the Chinese standard. Um, the tests include filtration efficiency, inhalation and exhalation resistance, and then for non-medical particulate respirators, a, a valve leakage test if there's a valve present. These masks are bombarded um, in the filtration efficiency test with a sodium chloride particulate challenge if there's an N rating or a dioptyl phthalate for a P or an R rating. Um, P and R are generally used more in industry, and so we'll focus on the N rating. Um, that uses, again, that sodium chloride particulate with a 0.3 micron particle size. That's generally accepted to be the most penetrating particle size for these products. Um, we have a very high flow rate of 85 liters per minute and a neutralization on the charge. Um, that, that kind of takes out the electrostatic effect that could could benefit a respirator in, in real life use and tests um, quite rigorously the material that it's made out of. The inhalation and exhalation resistance test is just a measure of how easily the mask is breathed through. Um, it evaluates the resistance of the air coming through and going out of the mask, um, again at that high 85 liter per minute flow rate. And then just a note that valve leakage test is a requirement for minimizing the leakage on valves that are present. Um, in a medical setting, you wouldn't see those valves as they're not allowed. So medical face masks are, are tested with a completely different set of tests. And you can see in this table, um, the darker blue ASTM F2100 is the American set of requirements and the lighter blue EN14683 is the European set of requirements. Um, there's a bacterial filtration efficiency test, a particulate filtration efficiency test that uses a, a latex sphere rather than that sodium chloride, um, that synthetic blood or fluid resistance test that Alpa mentioned, differential pressure for breathability, um, flammability or flame resistance, microbial cleanliness for a, a bio burden or, or load, and a biocompatibility test. So just to get into some more specifics on some of those tests, the bacterial filtration efficiency test is ensuring that these masks are, are able to control the source. Um, so when we speak, when we cough, when we sneeze, when we laugh, um, there's, there's small particles exiting our mouth and our nose all the time. In general, these face masks, the medical ones, are, are used in a place where we want to keep the, the germs or the small particles in with the person who generated them. Um, you can imagine in an operating room situation, a, a bacteria that may not cause harm if it's in intact skin in your mouth could cause a very serious infection if it gets into a surgical wound. Um, so this bacterial filtration efficiency test uses a range of particle sizes that are controlled to a mean particle size of approximately three microns. Um, it follows some published standards and it just measures the filtration efficiency at 28.3 liters per minute. So a much slower flow rate than that particulate filtration efficiency for the rest. Some more of the tests, the differential pressure test is again at a slower flow rate, eight liters per minute and evaluates how easy it is to breathe through the mask. And um, this is less of a, a protection factor and more of a comfort factor, but it's important as we found um, wearing masks in general life for those masks to be comfortable as well as functional. The synthetic blood penetration evaluates for blood and body fluid resistance. Um, there's three potential test pressures, and this is the one test that deals with protecting the folks who are wearing those masks. In a medical setting, it's quite important for 
these products to perform in a way that protects our healthcare workers from potential splatters. The flammability test determines the ignition risk and, and the burn time, and there's requirements to ensure that these products are, are either not igniting, slow to ignite, and slow to burn to give anyone who's wearing it in a, a potential risky situation where there's a, an ignition risk um, some peace of mind to know that they they won't have to deal with a burning mask if, if there's an exposure. And then the particulate filtration efficiency for medical face masks, again, follows a different standard than the NIOSH test and uses a 0.1 micron latex sphere, again, at that slower flow rate of 28.3 liters per minute. Um, so you can see with some of these, these tests, there are differences between a respirator, which is meant to protect the person wearing it, and a medical face mask that's meant for source control. Um, there's also some biocompatibility testing. As Alba mentioned, it's, it's important for us to know that these products that we're putting on our faces and, and keeping there for hours and sometimes cumulatively days on end are not going to cause irrit irritation to our skin. Um, any sort of sensitization or allergic results and, and any toxicity. Um, in addition, some, some masks are tested for microbial cleanliness and sterility. Those are generally isolated to products that are used in a sterile environment like a surgical suite. We do have some additional testing that we, we recommend uh, for these medical masks. Real-time and accelerated aging can help with determination of a shelf life. Sterilization validation is important if these products are going into a sterile operating field to ensure that they are sterile before they start. Um, periodic testing to monitor drift that might happen as raw materials are changed, as manufacturing updates, and a viral filtration efficiency test just to see how those products are performing against a, a different live challenge. Um, as Alpa mentioned, these tests are performed after the decontamination as well. We want to ensure that any steps we've taken to decontaminate a mask have not affected their ability to, to protect the, the user or the folks on the other side of that mask. And then this new, new standard, the barrier face covering standard that was just published, has a short duration test with those 0 0.3 micron sodium chloride particles that are used in a there's also an inhalation resistance test to ensure some, some comfort for the user. Um, those biocompatibility tests to ensure that these masks are not going to irritate the skin and a flammability test. Um, as far as fit to the face, respirators, uh, according to, to the NIOSH standards, have to have a fit test and, and minimize leakage. This barrier face covering allows for intelligent design um, to design a mask that fits well to the face and, and is sized appropriate to fit each different person's face. And, and there's an optional test um, that can help determine whether that design is appropriate, but it's not required for claiming compliance to the standard. Um, that bacterial filtration efficiency test as well um, is an optional test and can be included as maybe a label claim. Um, and then again, like we talked about with, with reprocessing, if these barrier face coverings are a reusable product, um, we want to make sure that they're labeled appropriately and have user instructions for laundering. And those tests that are ensuring the performance are performed both on a new product and a product after the laundering has, has been performed to ensure that the, the product is still protective. Um, it's still doing its job. It's still meeting those so a few references um, for some of the things that we've been talking about, the, the respirators and the face masks, um, some of the emergency use authorizations that we've mentioned are available um, on the FDA website. So a couple more. There's been a lot going on over the past year, so there's a lot of information to, to digest. You can see here our contact information. Thank you so much for attending the webinar. If you do have questions, you can reach us um, either by phone or by email using the information on the screen. 
And some more educational events and resources can be found as well um, on both the Nelson Labs and the Sterogenics website. You can see some of the offerings and, and some links to these web pages here. So we'll turn the time back over to Mike to wrap us up. Well, thank you, Janelle and Alpa, for this uh, great presentation today. Um, we we thank you all for attending this um, uh, present. We'd like to thank the presenters, Alpa and Janelle, for their insights. And we'd like to thank you, the viewer, for attending this session. And we hope that you found this to be valuable. Thank you and have a good day.